But the book of Acts, chapter 7, we'll start in 55. This is a story that, about a man that had to overcome some obstacles. And what happened to him during the times he was overcoming is what God was doing at the time that he overcome. There was a man, his name was Stephen. He wasn't designated as a pastor or a preacher or an apostle. He was considered as a deacon. It was his responsibility to minister over the helping of the feeding of the widows and taking care of the problems that was taking in the church. By now the church is reaching upwards of about 100,000 people, they seem to think. So there was a big thing going on with the widows in different areas and why they wouldn't be administered. The Greeks got upset with the other Jews there, the Greeks that came back in had been in captivity and came back and they spoke Greek and they thought they were being looked down upon, but they said it's not meet for us to leave the word and point you out seven men to handle the day-to-day -day proceedings of the church. And this is one of the men that we're talking about tonight. I'll get back to this whole story here in a minute. But in verse 55, speaking of Stephen now, it says, but he being full of the Holy Ghost, looked steadfastly into the heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. And they cried with a loud voice, stopped up their ears, and ran upon him in one accord. Look at there, I see Jesus. He ain't sitting down no more. He's standing up. What is the thing that made Jesus stand up? Would you pray with me this night? Father, we just praise you for who you are this night. You are King of Kings. You are Lord of Lords. You are our Master, our Redeemer. You're the one God that we give all hope and all praise to. You're the one, Father, that spoke and helped the world and the worlds came into existence. You're the ones, Father, that made up the way that we can have salvation. You prepared a place for your church to be at the eternity to worship you. Now, Father, this night I pray you would use the stumbling ways that we speak, Father, and use it to help us to overcome any obstacles we may come against us. But, Father, we just give you glory in this house because you're God. And there's none like it to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Stephen, <laughs> Ooh, what a man he was. Don't have much of him. We've got three chapters dedicated or two and a half chapters dedicated to him as to what he was going through. We don't hear of him until the sixth chapter, I believe it was, when they said they wanted to have this problem handled. They said, point you out seven men full of the Holy Ghost and a good report. And they brought Stephen along with Philip and the other five men there, Philip and Stephen, we all remember their names. And they laid hands on him and put him out to work and Stephen went out preaching. And it said as he went, there was many signs and many wonders and many miracles done in his hand. People were being saved. People were being healed. There was something happening in his ministry. There was something going on in his excitement, in his body, in his anointing. There was something happening when Stephen went somewhere. He wasn't a pastor. He was just a man that God had called to go out and take care of the business of the church. But here he is walking around, laying hands on people, telling people about Jesus. And as these seven men went out, all of them went out doing something of the same nature. And as they went out, it said the church grew. Over 100,000 Jews. The same ones that had said, crucify him, away with him. We don't want no part of him. His blood be upon us and upon our children are converting to the very one and having the very thing happen that should happen as his blood covered up their sins. Stephen is out preaching. And as most places go along, they didn't, the powers that be didn't like this preaching. And they brought him to task. Can you imagine? I think there was four sects brought him before the Sanhedrin court. And they stood him up and said, We don't like what he's saying. And so they looked upon him, it's like looking upon the face of an angel. Because God was in him so much. Because there was so much authority and so much love of God flowed to him that all they could see 
was the glow on his face. They knew that he was somebody to be reckoned with in the spiritual realm. And the devil was fighting against him tooth and nail. He was the one that had to overcome every obstacle around him. But he looked at them and just smiled and God just radiated through him. And they said, you're teaching a doctrine contrary to what we believe. You can't do that. See, I thought something about Jesus, doesn't it? See, I thought we say about a lot of us. It's going to be all right. You just go ahead and do what you... We've got to overcome the things that have been set up by the powers that be that say that this is okay if this goes on and this goes on, but God doesn't say that. He don't want us living a holy life. He wants us living an acceptable life. Philip and Stephen is sitting there and he looks upon them and they said, you don't believe in the law. You don't believe in all these things. You, you sound like that one before us and he's going to tear down the temple in three days. He's going to raise it back up. So what do you got to say for yourself? What does it take to make the Son of God which is seated down at the right hand of the Father in the place of authority, in the place of a position where he's supposed to be at to start with where he left from to come to this earth? He is set back down at the right hand of the Father in His place. What makes Him stand up? What is it that got Him so stirred up in the heavenlies that He stood up as one of His children was being cross-examined for His walk? I know we can kind of look back. We see what Peter, as, as Stephen sat back and began to talk, he said, y'all say, I don't believe in this. Let me just take you for a little trip through the time. Let's start with Abraham. He had the faith to know that he was looking for a city whose builder and maker was God. When he was still in this place, God told him to go here and he went. He promised him a, 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 a new place that he never set foot on. He promised him a great nation and never had a child, but he believed God. Can you hear his demons beginning to preach to these people? But you looked upon him, you looked at people that they set up on a pedestal. And looked up to him, Father Abraham, we look up to him. He went on to Moses and said, Moses at the age of 40 year old stood up after being raised in Pharaoh's house and slew an Egyptian that was coming and hurting a fellow Hebrew brother. Only to have a few days later have come across two Hebrews that was in a thing that said, why are you doing this seeing y'all are the same, have the same beliefs, you're same Christians, why are you fighting with each other? He said, what are you going to do, kill us too? And he ran. Stephen is slowly proclaiming to them everything that they believe. The people that put up on them took through the whole life of Moses as he led the people out of Egypt with a powerful hand as God used him as they went across the Red Sea and as they looked, they, when they came made the Ten Commandments came down through Moses as God gave them to him, went on to the place where they had made the golden calf and worshipped the calf because they had to have something to worship. Stephen is just proclaiming, hitting everything that he can hit with him. He continues on as he gets to look and see what was going on. He said, all these prophets that the Father has sent to you proclaiming about the just one that's coming. They all said Jesus was coming, but y'all don't believe the prophets. You just kill them. You stiff-necked, uncircumcised bunch of... Sounds something like when Jesus said you bunch of a generation of vipers who was warned you the wrath to come as John the Baptist. If John the Baptist was preaching, he said, you, you're snakes, your daddy, your children were snakes, your children, children were snakes, your daddy, your granddaddy. Everybody there was snakes. They were deceiving the people. That's all they were doing. These Sanhedrin people were deceiving the people, trying to keep them under their subjection where they could have control of what was going on. But God says, I want you to have liberty. I want you to have freedom. I want you to know who I am and worship me. As Stephen began to stand up and tell them what was going on, what was happening, all of a sudden something began to take place. All these people were standing there in Amber. He had, I don't know how many people was around him. He said he was standing, as we think, alone. But all of the Sanhedrin court was there. All of the uh, Libertines Libertine was there and the Syrians and a few other groups that was there that's proclaiming against him. Don't know how many was there, but we're going to guess there was hundreds surrounding him against this one man. But one person in God is a majority. One person in God, as Stephen stood there and told them they had to be silent and hear 
what he had to say. When the enemy comes against you, you can tell him what God has to say and he cannot stop you. You're an overcomer by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of your testimony. You can let people know Jim Stevens just stood up. He was not a theologian, but he knew I can almost in our mindset how we think things out. You can almost see as Jesus is sitting by the Father. He's, he's listening to me. He's telling him what I told him to say. He's not holding back. He's not holding back. Can you hear him, Father? He's, really, he's, he's telling him like it is. Souls are going to be changed by the way the ministry is going out from that man. There's something fixed to take place in this house. They're going to reject him here in a minute, but I'm so proud of the fact that he's standing up for what he believes in. I'm so proud that he's given up and he's, we've seen the miracles that he has done. He's, we've used him many times, Father. He's been one that has been faithful to us. and He's standing there right now in a place where he needs us more than he's ever needed us before. And he's standing there proud of who he is. Standing there under the anointing of God, under my strength. And he's speaking the words I give him to speak. But can you see him, Father? Can you see him? Can you see the love that his heart he has for us? He's seen the love. Stephen is dead to head speaking. Probably one of the most prolific messages we have in the Bible is what Stephen preached. Greater than the day, even the day of Pentecost when Peter stood up and preached. Where thousands were saved that day. Stephen is standing there against a stacked deck because they got their mind made up. We don't want this. The world today has got their mind made up. I'm happy where I'm at. I don't want any more of this. I don't want any more of God than what I already have. I've got just, I got me a little bit of fire insurance and I'm happy. I got my fire insurance when I was 10, 11, 12, maybe even 30 or 40 years old. I got my fire insurance. I made a confession of faith. Nothing changed in my life, but I made a confession of faith. These people were educated in the Bible. The Sanhedrin was the scribes of the day, and the Pharisees was the ones that kept going on with it. They were sitting there, they were the scribes of the day. They knew what the Word said. They said the law frontwards and backwards and backwards and forwards, and they even said that when they were trying to question Him, they couldn't get a word in the edge of life. There are some scholars that believe that as we see that Paul was consenting at his death that they laid the clothes down in front of Paul that that time it was Saul. And Saul was sitting there. They, they say he was the hope of the sand of the Pharisees. He was the what do you, golden boy of the age. He, he was one of the greatest students of the Word. He knew it and he believed it. He stood upon what he believed. It might have been wrong, but he stood upon what he believed because he believed in the law. He believed in trying to work a place and anointing that was something that was he could get a hold of. But it might have been him, they say, that was this highly educated man that was taught from his baby, from his childhood up against this Holy Ghost-filled young man. Couldn't have been saved more than just a few years. Had no formal training in the Word, but he could not overcome him because the anointing was upon Stephen as God used him and spoke through him. Can you see Stephen standing there going toe to toe with the greatest minds of the law as they begin to speak and say, but the Bible says that Moses came down at the, the commandments and this is what he told us to do. He tells us to do this no more. He said, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. You mean we don't have to keep the commandments no more? No, you don't have to, but you will want to because you'll want to please him. They can't get you into heaven. His blood can get you into heaven. Can you begin to see the message that he was talking to him as he begins to speak? And all this that's taking place right now as Stephen is speaking, if indeed it was Saul that was asking him the questions, God was using this at this time. I'm going to say it was. That's what seems to be what everybody believes. God was using this at this time that in a short period down the road, Saul be walking down the road and God would speak to him and turn his life around and turn him into Paul. Make him one of the most prolific writers we have in the Bible. 
One started more churches, done more mission work than anybody around him. We have record of his way to speak and his way to comprehend the grace of God was unparalleled in that particular point in time, even until today. But can you see as he's looking back now as he's on the Damascus Road and thinking about all those things that Stephen said? He said it was grace, not works. He said it was the blood sacrifice of Jesus, not of lambs or goats or bullocks. He said it was joy unspeakable and full of glory. And the half is yet to be told. But I, I, he was so right. And I was so wrong in doing what I'd done. But Father, I thank you give me a chance to turn my life around and do what I'm supposed to be doing. Thank you for sending Stephen to me. I may have been there consenting to his death. Thank you, Lord, for sending Stephen to me. And I might hear that word. Stephen's coming to the end of the message. He goes on and talks about Solomon building the temple. David's son David had laid the plans out. He had all the materials there, but God would let him build the temple. So Solomon built the temple and dedicated the temple to God. But it got to where they were worshiping the temple more than who was in the temple. The temple became an idol, if you will. So he began to tell us that all these things that you're looking for, all these little details that you're so detailed in trying to get done, it's just it's not saving you, but it's just holding you back because God wants to do it another way now. We've entered the dispensation time of grace. Stephen sat there and all of a sudden, the Holy Ghost hit him right between the shoulder blades. And the words come out of him. <laughs> he started out, you stiff necked, and uncircumcised, and hard in ears. Not only is your heart hard, but your ears are hard. You don't want to hear. You do all you resist the Holy Ghost, even as your fathers did. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted, and have not slain, which showed before the coming of the just one, whom ye have been now the betrayers and the murderers who have, not, who have received the law by the dispensation of angels and not kept it. Can you imagine? Now when I get excited sometimes I jump up, stand up, don't you? I can't jump up as fast as I used to jump up, but I can still jump up. About that time, God, can you just see him in heaven as the father is sitting there beside the son and said, the son said, let's bring him home, Dad. That's a faithful one there. He's done what we wanted him to do. He's planted a seed in Saul that, was, that will create something. It might have been that one soul that God puts you in the path of to touch their life. But you don't see the answer right now, but the answer is coming. What makes Jesus stand up beside the Father is when His people obey Him and allow Him to move in their way that He wants them to move. All of a sudden, Jesus stood up. People say so. He stood up to welcome Him home. To, and He opened up all the portals of heaven. He saw the throne of God. The glory of God. He sees the throne as He begins to see the throne of God. He sees Jesus standing by the right hand of the Father. Standing in the place of authority. The place that he was sitting in moments ago, now he's standing up. Why is he standing up? He's so excited about the homecoming of his children. He's so excited about the obedience of his children. He's so excited about this one that has stood up and told everybody how at the threat of death, he stood up. Now, he could have stood up and come down there and put a betray, put a, a fence around Stephen and a rock could have never touched him. He could have come down with a boat of lightning and wiped out all those people that was fixing to stone Stephen. We don't understand God's timing and what he does, but all this was done for a purpose. All this was done for a reason. Everything that was happening to Stephen right now was foreordained and foreknown by God. Are you willing to do that which God wants you to do? Are you willing to stand up in the time of heat and trouble and say, Thus saith the Lord. That's what Stephen done. 
And they ran upon him with all of their might. The Bible says they gnashed on him with their teeth. They were, I mean, they were just, don't mean they were chewing on him. It means they were just really, you sorry so-and-so, just that, 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 just give him a heart, just keep him alive. They took him out of the city. He said they couldn't do it in the city. So they had to go outside the city. The whole time that this is taking place, Jesus is still standing up. Still watching everything unfold. Still hoping that someone there that's fixing to pick up a rock will repent and turn from what they have just heard and not do what's going on. They had a choice. I can throw the rock or I can repent. And he's, the whole time he's standing up, he's got his hand on Stephen, letting him feel a peace that he's never felt before, feel the joy, he's letting him, he's letting him see what's taking place in heaven. And the whole time he's searching through the crowd, saying, does anybody here want to have what he has? Does anybody here want to feel what he feels right now, see what he sees right now? I'm standing up. I'm ready to do what you want me to do. But they took their coats off. And so they laid them at the feet of the man named Saul. Why in the world did they do that? It's hard to throw a rock with a coat on, isn't it? So they'd get their throwing arm a little bit easier tied off. It wasn't an act of repentance. It was an act of just, I've got to get a better aim. I'm going to throw these rocks harder at this man because I just don't believe that he has anything that I want to hear. Jesus is still standing there at the right hand, watching it all take place. He stood up because his servant stood the test of time. He stood up because his servant was in a place of need where he had to have a strengthening that he did not have within him. He stood up because that man had stood up and proclaimed who he was and how much love he has. He stood up as the first rock began to fall. Stephen, can, I can't imagine what was going on. His, in my mind, it's like throwing rocks at me. I'd be wanting to pick it up and go back, wouldn't you? And as they stoned him, Stephen, calling upon the name of God, saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He says, come on, I got you. Come on, I'm waiting on you. Come on, I love you. I have used you in ways that you you'll be used from time and time and eternity. Used him today. Over 2,000 years later, he's using him today as an instrument to bring souls to Calvary, as an instrument of knowing what an overcomer is. He said, come on up. He said, oh, by the way, Father, don't lay this sin to their charge. Don't, make, don't punish them for what they're doing. Find a way to Turn them around to where they can hear the word that was spoken that you spoke to me on, that they might be saved. That there come a point in time that I'll see the same people that throw rocks at me with you in heaven. Can you, can you begin to fathom that? Can you pray for the one that hurts you the most and ask the Father to let them, let them spend eternity with you giving them glory. <coughs> Can you ask the Father to have him don't, don't lay that sin to the charge. They, they did it. And there's no doubt about they've done it. I've got the bruises to prove it. I've got the, I've got the, where the ones hit me in different locations. But God, don't lay that sin to their charge. God, I want to see them in heaven. I want to see them in a place where they can worship you. I want to see them seeing how great and how powerful how loving you are. Can you see him begin to cry out to God? Jesus is still standing up. I got you. You know, I don't uh, 
any one of these individuals that threw that rock. According to the way I read this, Saul though, did not throw the first rock. He was there. He enticed it. He brought it around to be. He stood there as a witness to it. They piled the coats up at his feet. But God turned that person around and he said, don't lay this sin to their charge. If there's anyone that responsibly who didn't know the first stone, it was Saul, wasn't it? Don't lay this sin to their charge. So by not laying the sin to the charge, Saul, as he walked down the Damascus Road, had that experience and as God began to take him and transform him and show him the greatest vision of grace, no other writer has enabled the power of grace like Paul did. As he wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, when we leave the book of Acts, it's Paul's writing all the way through Hebrews. You young ones that just quoted those scriptures this morning, and those verses, those baptisms this morning, most of those, that carries, that carries about two-thirds of the book. The first five and the last seven or eight, or however many they are after, after Hebrews, are all attributed to this one man that God did not lay the charge of sin to him because of what he did. Why did Jesus stand up? As he stood up ever again, we have, this is the only instance I know of in the Bible where we see Jesus standing up. And he stood up again, he stood up once, he stood up before again. There are people today that he's standing in the gap. He is touching hearts and touching lives as he stands, looks, and receives those home that have showed him so much love and so much compassion and so much joy that he has received from those individuals. Their life was not perfect. I dare say there's nobody under the sound of my voice that done the deeds that Saul done. Done him in the name of religion. Done him in the name of what he thought was right. But he still done. Persecuted would go out and drag people all the way back to Jerusalem to put them in prison, to have them hung, to kill and try to stop the movement of God. But when God got a hold of him and turned him around, he brought in thousands more than what he ever took away. I don't know about you, but I want to be used by God in that same way that he used Stephen. When my time comes, I want to see the Father standing at the right hand of the Father. Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father. We're going to hear him say, enter into the joys of the Lord. As he steps out of the clouds of glory and comes and gets his church. And we're going to leave this earth behind. We are going to be in his presence. United with him. Let's take all with us that we can. No matter what came against this man, he stood up. You never know who that last person you talk to will be that God sticks in the years. The story goes that there was a Sunday school teacher. It's all he ever done was taught Sunday school. And I don't remember the story exactly, but the, the, the moral of the story was that there was a young man in his congregation. And that young man in the congregation, God called him to preach. And as he began to call to preach, he went ahead and there was a young man in one of his, one of his crusades or one of his preaching revivals, I guess the best way to put it back in that day, came forth and gave his life to Jesus Christ. It all backed up to that one that was teaching the Sunday school. That man that was saved in that revival's name was Billy Graham. And there's never been another message like grace and salvation preached like that man can preach it. There are other messages that 
We won't get into it, but I, that man could preach salvation better than any man I ever heard. He could preach the love of God so sweet that you could almost taste it. And the power of God in that day was moving through him. Today, as God moves in His strength and His power, as we close out this chapter of grace, as we prepare for the great soon coming of our Lord, the rapture of the church, as we prepare to go out and do battle with our enemy, I want you to know that Jesus is standing by the right hand of the Father. And He's standing there saying, I'm going to take care of you. When they begin to throw the rocks, they aren't going to hurt you. So He's just... He just bent over and went to sleep. Didn't say he died, he went to sleep. Because that body was present with the Lord. So as he went to sleep, that body went to sleep, his soul was in the portals of glory. He was embraced. I believe it. I, believe, I don't have a first scripture to prove it by or nothing else, but I believe that when Stephen came up there, the first thing he done was got a big hug from Jesus as he loved him and told him how grateful he was and how much, but I believe Stephen just sat down and said, I'm your servant. I want to worship you. This night as we leave out of this place, no matter what you hear, I want you to know this one thing, there comes a time in your life when you just think you can't make another step. I want you to know that Jesus has stood up at that point in time and he's making intercession and he's reaching out and he's giving you the strength for what you're fixing to go through. And he's given you the ability to stand when you don't think you could stand. When they come against you with different ways and teachings and things that's going on and you don't understand what's going on, all of a sudden words are going to come to your spirit that you had no knowledge of. And the wisdom that you're speaking, listen to it as God begins to move in your midst. Stephen, they took him on out and they buried his body. But he lives forevermore. He lives forevermore. His legacy lives forevermore. Not only his soul in heaven, but his legacy lives forevermore. We search and try to find a reason why Jesus stood up. The answer is what we talked about this morning. He loved him so much, he stood up and made a way for him to come into his presence. Would you stand with me tonight? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The Bible says when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord's going to lift up a standard against it. He's going to put a stop to it. If you're going through a trouble or through a trial this night, if you're a child of God, and I believe we all are, He's standing up saying, you know, He'll just. Trust me. See, you don't understand the rocks that are hitting my body right now. You don't understand the pain that's inflicting into me. You don't understand how it feels to be totally rejected by those that I considered, I'll be considered consent, considered the sanity of friends or not, but consider the ones that I was sent to to minister to. they done this to me. God's got his hand upon your life. If you'll let him guide you in every step. Some of us have kind of tried, he's got our, I've got a straight line right here. He's got us walking down this line here. Some of us want to walk on this side here just a little bit. We're still walking straight, but we're not on the line. God has a pathway he wants us to go. He had Stephen in that pathway. I want you to get in that pathway that God has for you because he's got something great. Anybody need something special from God? I'll, let me rephrase it. Anybody that's supposed to come to these altars tonight? We're fixing to go into a battle. How about you? I need God's grace. Will everybody come to this altar tonight? We want to pray for God to give us the strength to stand as Stephen stood.